Good afternoon. I'm Bev Hartline. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and the Dean of the Graduate School at Montana Tech, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's public lecture. But before I do that, I want to make sure everybody is aware that on Thursday, we have another speaker, it's John Rausch. He's going to be talking about the strategies for the next generation in conservation, lessons from a life in environmental leadership. He'll be speaking in the Chemical Biology Building, Room 102. Today's speaker is an extremely distinguished drum major for justice. Uh, John Britton is a professor of law at the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark Law School. Uh, he has served as dean of the Thurgood Marshall Law School at Texas Southern University, taught at the University of Connecticut's Law School, he was chief counsel for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, founded by President Kennedy. I believe he has, he has been involved in civil rights, access to education, access to other resources, for disadvantaged groups since some time in the 60s, um, and uh, an extremely visible and persuasive activist in that regard. I know he was involved in the um, case that resulted in segregating the Hartford Public Schools um, a few years ago, and has been recently one of the key individuals in the um, Maryland case uh, regarding the um, access to resources um, by the historically black colleges from the, um, from the Maryland state. And uh, over the past few years, there have been a number of very important legal decisions um, with respect to access to higher education. And it's my pleasure to welcome John C. Britton professor of law to speak about affirmative action endures three decades of challenges, the pursuit of diversity on campus. John. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kathy, are my slides up? Good afternoon, everyone, here at Montana Tech, as well as any others who may join via teleconferencing. It's indeed my honor and my pleasure to come to such a quaint place in the Rocky Mountain West to lecture today on a subject dealing with diversity in higher education. I'm indeed indebted to my wonderful hosts here a Bev Hartline, of course, who needs no introduction, and her husband, Fred, who have treated me with the utmost kindness and generosity in my visit to Butte, Montana. I thank them for inviting me. I'm here to talk to you today about affirmative action. And I'll start off with a uh, quote Pressing, Kathy. Okay. Keyboard's not working either. Everything is frozen. Yeah, that was before you started projecting it. I have to use the Thank you. I begin with this quote that seems to uh, symbolize the issue that affirmative action is one of the most contentious issues in higher education today. Indeed, in a much uh, broader context, affirmative action as a social issue uh, ranks high with abortions, 
and the death penalty and church and state relations. So the lecture today involves the subject of educational policy, constitutionality, and general public perceptions. It's going to stretch from the early 1970s to the present time. And this symbolizes from the educational standpoint to the ballot box, the bookends of affirmative action. Affirmative action, in terms of a little data, has largely been shaped by the Supreme Court. In these roughly 35 years, indeed 40 years, if you add one case that went to the United States Supreme Court but was not decided because the court said it was moot. Moot is a legal term meaning that by the time the case reaches the court, there's no longer any case of controversy because the student who challenged the affirmative action policy at the University of Washington had graduated. Therefore, there was no challenge to the alleged claim of denial of admission due to improper conduct. In addition, all of the plaintiffs in affirmative action have been white, and they have claimed discrimination in the use of race for the admissions process. All have been filed against traditionally white institutions who defended their policies, and indeed, vicariously represented the beneficiaries of color in the affirmative action policies. Non-white minorities have never been involved in any of these cases as direct parties. However, they have been involved in what are called friends of the court briefs and in some collaboration with the institutions and their lawyers in presenting and defending affirmative action in the courts. Today, in my lecture at an educational institution, I feel ethically obligated to say and to disclose that I have been involved in all of the cases in which I shall discuss as an advocate for the educational institutions. I've been counsel for such organizations as the NAACP and other civil rights organizations in filing briefs at the United States Supreme Court. Most recently, when we get to the end of the trilogy of these cases, I was counsel for over three dozen legislators who filed a friend of the court brief in the University of Texas at Austin case to explain why the legislature supported the affirmative action policies of the universities in Texas. All of these cases too involve what is called the split in the Supreme Court between the more conservative wing of the court and the more moderative wing of the court and what they call these 5-4 decisions or one way or the other in the cases. Despite all of the challenges in the three Supreme Court cases, four of which I'll mention as a tail end closing, affirmative action has survived. And it's come to represent the last point of mend it, but don't end it. And that symbolizes affirmative action. The three cases, going back to 1978, have been Bakke versus the Board of Regents, involving the University of California at Davis Medical School, and the use of race in a way that's no longer proper, and moved 25 years later, up to Gruder and Gretz, the modern day standard for affirmative action in both a case involving the undergraduate school that was Grutter, excuse me, the law school that was Grutter, and the undergraduate school that was Gretz. The Supreme Court upheld the Grutter law school model and struck down the Gretz under, undergraduate model, as I shall explain. And then more recently, we have the University of Texas at Austin case, a decision in 213 by the Supreme Court, which is really going to be called a non-decision or a technical decision. These are the policies involved in the subject of affirmative action in universities' mission. 
One is the use of race sensitive admissions to increase diversity for sound educational reasons. That sound educational reason both has constitutional implications as well as educational impl implications. The university though, in terms of the third bullet point, is exercising what is known as its academic freedom rights to determine what is a sound education to educate the students. And across the nation, uh, universities have determined that the racial and ethnic diversity is essential to providing a sound educational program. And therefore, they have undertook methods in the admissions process to create not only overall diversity in terms of the statistical, social, and economic breakdown of the students, but also to provide a critical mass and essential component parts of all aspects of the university in the classrooms, in the programs, in order to uh, reach its goal of diversity and a sound educational policy. And in the middle one, the courts have determined that the use of race in college admissions meets one of the two standards I shall describe of a compelling state interest. In the first one, way back in 1978, as some biographical backdrop, I was an attorney practicing law privately in San Francisco, California. I had come to California from Mississippi, where the first four years of my practice from graduating in law school was in civil rights. When I got to California, I wanted to be one of the million dollar round table members of the tort bar. But my civil rights followed me and I became involved again from the outside with many advocacy groups and working closely with the council and with the administration of the uh, universe, excuse me, of the University of California at Davis and their whole system in defending affirmative action. The 1978 decision was a very unique, what is called 414 decision, with Justice Lewis Powell leading three other justices in striking down the University of California affirmative action system at Davis Medical School. Nevertheless, in the judgment, which says who wins and who loses, he voted with the majority to strike down the program. But he sided with the dissenters in agreeing that race could be used in a different fashion in affirmative action. And reaching out of whole cloth in the sky, which is hard, which is highly unusual in the litigation process, where the parties never briefed the issue, never discussed the issue, never knew about the issue, he found that Harvard's plan in affirmative action that took into account race along with many other factors was reasonable. And therefore, the decision led to a slight 5-4 majority that while the plan at Davis was unconstitutional, the practice of using race was constitutional and that lasted for the next 25 years and was often cited. There was one little hiccup, shall we say, as I shall point out a little bit later, around 1995, when the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, that's the level right before the United States Supreme Court, involving the states of Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi, found that despite everyone's agreement that Bakke stood for the legal use of race, that court said, with some temerity, and virtually overruling the Supreme Court, that the decision didn't say what everybody thought it did, and that really, affirmative action was banned. And so the Fifth Circuit banned it in Texas and in Louisiana and Mississippi uh, from a 19, a 95 to 213, a biased decision. Certainly, Bakke stood for no quotas. And ever since then, no university has ever had quotas. However, quotas are still 
a criticism of affirmative action, although no one uses it, and it's improper. And as I said, it permitted race. So Baki is the bedrock, bedrock of the trilogy of these cases. So we go 25 years out, except for this uh, Texas case in 1996, and Gruder or Grutter, it's pronounced both ways, even by the namesake person, overruled this Hotwood versus Texas, which was confined only to Mississippi. Speaking of confinement, in my dealings with the universities over the years, they all want to go to the Supreme Court and reach the ultimate decision by the justices on the legitimacy of their program. Back in California, after in the first case, the university and their counsel did such a poor job of defending the case that we urged them to stop and not take the case to the Supreme Court. We urged them to stop and confine what we call the limitations on affirmative action adjust to the state of California because you see the Bakke case was decided by the California Supreme Court. Therefore, it limited its holding only to that state, notwithstanding it's a big one, but there were 49 other states. However, they insisted upon reaching, as I said, the penultimate decision by the Supreme Court that they took it anyway. And while they survived, they did expose their weaknesses, both in their plan as well as in their defense. So Luther came along and it fixed everything for affirmative action. It declared race conscious admissions that passes the constitutional test on both of the two prongs that I shall, admit, that, that I shall discuss. And it approved race as a factor. That was the difference now between Bakke, in which it was the sole factor, and Gruder, in which it could be a factor, along with many other factors, in a holistic approach to affirmative action. As many of you may know in higher education, some of the factors in the admission process certainly includes the applicant's score on standardized tests. It includes their grade point average and any references from teachers and professors. It includes their other activities, often includes their ability to overcome disadvantages. And then you have all of these other special factors, whether they're in the band, they play instruments, they are an athlete, of course, they speak multiple languages, and they even have geographic, where I'm sure some universities back east will consider it a positive factor to have an applicant from Butte, Montana, applying to a Northeast university because they just don't have much Rocky Mountain Far West geographic diversity in their student body. And then we go 10 years out to the present in terms of Fisher versus the University of Texas at Austin. This is what I call a technical non-decision because it didn't decide like the other two cases whether the plan at the University of Texas met the constitutional standard. Rather, it sent the case back as typical in litigation procedure to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and presumably could have been sent back down to the district court to reinterpret the decision in line with the new standard or clarified standard set by the court. More on that in a moment. Nevertheless, it re-upheld the basic constitutional test that when the government seeks to use race, since race has been used in such an evil fashion in the past, that the government agency must satisfy what is called the first prong of the strict scrutiny test, that the government is involved in a compelling state interest. And secondly, the government must show that it is using the least restrictive means. Restrictive in the sense that it has the least impact upon one group of persons. This is also translated into the question of whether the government has any race neutral means in order to achieve diversity. There are a number of race-neutral means that I shall mention. 
And so, affirmative action, once again, survived at the highest court in the nation, came out intact, and the decision, uh, by virtue of the technical legal aspects, upheld the Grutter decision, and only 10 years from that decision, of the Supreme Court allowed affirmative action to stand where it is today. This 10-year period has a unique little backstory, again, with some unusual practice by the Supreme Court. The 2003 decision, in what are called for short the University of Michigan cases, was written by now retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman appointed to the United States Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor, at her time in her reign, was considered one of the swing votes that sometimes voted with the conservative wing of the court, sometimes voted with the moderate wing of the court. In the Grutter and Gratz case, although, again, the court struck down the undergraduate affirmative action plan at the University of Michigan because it was too numerically technical, that's somewhat counterintuitive, that we look for metric measures often in higher education. What the University of Michigan did is that it awarded points for many of those criteria that most admissions policies use to determine admission. And they had a number of points for race and ethnicity. And this, the court said, was too mechanical and too non-holistic an individual to simply award points based upon race. It was not quite as onerous as a quota, but it had the whiff of it, shall we say. Whereas the law school plan at the University of Michigan, it came to be the rule of the day, where the law school looked at candidates in a variety of lenses, where race was only one of many, but not the dominant, not the sole, and certainly not the deciding factor. From a more administrative practical standpoint, the law school could afford this holistic individual review because it admitted far fewer students in relationship to their total student population. Whereas the outcome of the University of Michigan cases meant that universities had to hire far more persons in the admissions office to engage in these individual holistic determinations of applicants if they wanted to continue to pursue their affirmative action of policy. I'll touch upon a little later some of the burdens that affirmative action causes universities. And so, once again, after these number of years, number of decades, affirmative action survived. It's almost like a cat that has nine lives. There was one other additional Supreme Court case this year. It's not an affirmative action case, but it has everything to do with affirmative action case. I didn't list it in the big three, but I present it nonetheless. This is a case out of Michigan called Shooty versus the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action, or it's also called the BAM case because the end of the long title of the nonprofit organization that formed to defend the affirmative action places at where did I say? The University of Michigan. What had happened just 10 years earlier? Supreme Court upheld, upheld affirmative action. So there's a correlation for you scientists in the room between the United States Supreme Court upholding affirmative action in 2003 and a referendum by the voters of Michigan in 2006. And that case, showing the amount of time it takes to reach the Supreme Court, uh, finally was decided by the Supreme Court in 2013. And what, excuse me, 14. And what Schutte held is that voters in a referendum 
have the right to ban affirmative action. And indeed, the Michigan affirmative action case included banning affirmative action in education and in employment and in government contracts. So it's not an affirmative action case in the sense that it looked at the methods and the means of affirmative action, but it is an affirmative action case in terms of it banned affirmative action. And so the conclusion is that voters may ban affirmative action and indeed, I teach it to my students that white voters may ban affirmative action anytime they object to it. For whom? For racial minorities. And part of the dispute, both in the court as well as in the communities of Michigan, is whether the ban on affirmative action by the voters was racial prejudice. The court held in what the dissent says is a blind eye, a so-called bandana around Lady Justice's eyes on the Statue of Liberty and elsewhere of not seeing that it was no coincidence that after the Supreme Court had upheld affirmative action, despite challenges to it, the voters decide to ban it. But the Michigan voters are not the only voters that have banned affirmative action. It's also been a ban in California, which was the first through a Proposition 209, as well as the state of Washington, which was the first case to go to the Supreme Court, called Marco de Funes versus Odegaard, the president of the University of Washington, and it's been banned in one or two other states. And more may come in the future after the Supreme Court upheld the Schutte case, the Attorney General, in uh, Michigan. And so it comes back to my theme. It doesn't take much to connect the dots. That affirmative action is governed by Supreme Court precedents because white plaintiffs have challenged affirmative action that benefits non-white minority students. It also involves a major public policy issue in the universities exercising their academic freedom to determine what is a sound education that includes diversity. And then, particularly by the vote in Shuti, it's a part of a much larger public debate about race in America today. Now, I'll touch upon a few of uh, just a couple of dimensions to look at the future of affirmative action. One of the side stories I was going to tell you is that in 2003, when Justice Sandra Day O'Connor decided the case and wrote the opinion for the majority of justices, she, like her predecessor of sorts, Justice Lewis Powell, picked a major point out of the thin air that had never been briefed below by the council, never been discussed by any of the lower courts, was a total surprise. And she said in her opinion that affirmative action would probably end in 25 years from that decision. And so she predicted there would no longer be a need for affirmative action by 2028. There was no basis for her decision, there no research on the decision, certainly no historians had given any opinion about the prediction. And so she may have been on a limb, but she may have also interpreted public policy positions that affirmative action will not last forever. One of the things I say quickly on the side, but I'm not a sociologist, that in many respects, the changing demographics of the nation are going to do what affirmative action cannot do in terms of the fact that by the year 2035, certainly by the year 2050, the racial and language minorities 
that we refer to today will become combined the numerical majority of the U.S. population. Or in other words, there will be more non-white persons than white persons. And several data points in the last several years seems to reaffirm that in terms of the fact that just a year ago, more non-white babies were born than white babies. And more white people died proportionally than non-white people. And the best prediction of the population of the future is to look at the persons 25, 20, or younger. And you will see that those younger persons are now a numerical majority of the population. And so the changing racial and ethnic demographics of our society is going to contribute to who is applying to college and who is admitted. And that's just one factor that will lead to the end of affirmative action as we know it today. Now, remember I told you about this Fisher case. And remember that second prong of the strict scrutiny test that measures whether public agencies may use race of any sort, in this particular case, in college admissions. But by the way, the public and private dichotomy is significant. And the private schools are not subject to the same restrictions on using race as the public schools. And as a result, there has been no challenge in these 35 to 40 years to affirmative action policies in private institutions. However, as a quick side note, private institutions use a policy called legacy preference. And legacy preference is the biggest affirmative action in the country today, and it's legal. And when I'm asked, do I oppose legacy preference? I say no, and people are surprised since I'm an advocate for affirmative action. And I say no because legacy preference offers the best contradiction to all those who oppose affirmative action today. And I like to keep that contradiction in the public eye. But back now to the second prong and back to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and back to her predictions and back to what are some of the non-racial least restrictive means being used today to promote diversity in college campuses. One of them is called the top 10% plan. And this was sub salento, a litigation point in this University of Texas case. Or you see, when I mentioned Fifth Circuit, 1995-1996, banned affirmative action, the whole state of Texas went to work to continue to promote affirmative action. And they came up with a policy called the top 10% plan. And under the top 10% plan, any student who graduates in the top 10% from their Texas high school is automatically admitted to one of the top universities, state public universities in Texas. California has a much smaller percentage. Florida had a much smaller percentage. None of them has big, have been as big as the Texas plan. And about 10 years out of adopting the top 10% plan, the University of Texas admitted over 80% of their first year students pursuant to the automatic top 10% plan. And when you threw in your band and you threw in your athletics and when you threw in your merit scholars, it left them only about eight to 10% of a window to exercise their discretion in developing a diverse plan. Top 10% plan though, did produce diversity. Not quite as high as race sensitive diversity, but nevertheless, and as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out in her dissent in the Fisher case, the success of the top 10% plan depends upon the racial segregation in the high schools where the students in high schools in virtually all segregated school districts 
are all going to be top 10 percenters. And therefore, that doesn't really solve the diversity problem. And indeed, it exacerbates it by utilizing it to determine college admissions. Next, there's a big movement from K through 12, in which I've been involved in all the major Supreme Court cases there too, to promote diversity, to use social and economic status or the income level of the families to determine admissions. The social and economic status criterion for admissions is virtually immune from constitutional challenge because it doesn't deal with race. Race is the only suspect classification, not poverty and class and social income status. The question is whether social income status-based admissions produces as much diversity as race-conscious admissions. The general conclusion is that it's better than no race-conscious, race-sensitive admissions, but it doesn't produce as much. It produces a different kind. We could go into more details on what that means. But suffice it to say, the top 10% plan and the social and economic status criterion for admission are well accepted now race neutral plans. And the question becomes whether a university has to test it and try it to see if it produces as much diversity as they want, or can they make a survey of it and study it and decide. When the University of Texas case was sent back to the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit just ruled this summer, and it once again upheld the University of Texas plan. Time doesn't permit me to go into the details of it, but it was a very sophisticated plan that looked at critical mass throughout the entire university, looked at the use of race in uh, a rather sophisticated set of metrics that the University of Texas learned, and it found that it even satisfied the Supreme Court's new clarification of that second prong of the strict scrutiny test, where in short, Texas doesn't have to try it first and see how it works. Texas, Texas can make an assessment uh, based upon a number of predictive factors and reach a conclusion. And so, once again, front of action has survived. The plaintiff, Abigail Fisher, has asked the Fifth Circuit to rehear the case en banc. That means these courts of appeals have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 22 justices on the courts of appeals, depending upon its size. Each decision by a court of appeals is decided by a panel of three judges. If the losing party for a decision decided by the panel of three judges wants to appeal, they may ask the entire court of appeals to rehear the case. That's called a rehearing en banc. The first Fisher case was reheard en banc. The University of Michigan case was heard on, on bond, and the Shooty case was heard on bond. The most controversial cases going through the court often go through the on bond process. So Abigail Fisher has now asked the Fifth Circuit to hear the case once again on bond. No decision has been rendered. We'll wait and see whether Fisher is going back to the Supreme Court or whether this Fifth Circuit decision upholding the University of Texas Affirmative Action is the latest final decision on the case. I have uh, recently published an article with others in a book predicting the end of affirmative action, at least preparing for it, and I've argued for reducing the reliance on standardized tests and increasing the emphasis on high school grades for high school, other grades for college, GPA, and use of teacher and other evaluations. Wake Forest has become one of the leading universities to offer what is called the test option, in which the applicant has the option to submit their test scores or to withhold them and submit their application on all other criteria other than test scores. And the studies by Wake Forest have concluded that there is no significant difference between the students admitted without the tests and the students who have been admitted with the tests and other universities are at least moving toward pilot projects to measure that experience. The med schools, with a number of significant ones, including your select ones, 
have long abandoned the MCAT, or the medical aptitude test, and have accepted students based upon the grade point averages and other criteria. <laughs> Lastly, I think the question of affirmative action is bound up in this closing statement by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and this is the only slide I'll read to you. The way to stop discriminating on the base of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and not to apply the Constitution and to apply the Constitution, excuse me, with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. As members of the judiciary tasked with intervening to carry out the guarantee of equal protection, we ought not to sit back and wish away rather than confront the racial inequality that exists in our society. It is this view that works harm by perpetuating the facile of notion, the facile notion that what makes race matter is acknowledging the simple truth that race does matter. I presume we'll take some questions and comments. Uh, Dr. Hartline says, I didn't talk about the Maryland case, and can I discuss it here? I didn't talk about the uh, Maryland case because the Maryland case doesn't involve the topic of my lecture today on the status of affirmative action in higher education. Nevertheless, uh, Dr. Hartline is referring to almost the flip side of the question of diversity. I say it's the flip side. Because if you take the holistic approach, our history and our jurisprudence is filled with the struggle of racial and language minorities to obtain equal educational opportunity. Affirmative action is the late 20th century push post-civil rights movement to integrate the traditional white institutions, both the previously de jure segregated institutions as well as the non-segregated, what I call up-south institutions. The flip side of that coin includes a long history and jurisprudence too to make historically black college and universities called HBCUs competitive and equal with traditional white institutions. And so the push for competitiveness and comparability is what's involved in a suit in the state of Maryland called the Coalition for Excellence in Higher Education in Maryland versus the state of Maryland. Maryland has four historical black institutions. Only North Carolina has more, and that's five. And they are by name Morgan State University, Coppin State University, and Bowie State University. They're all in a close geographic proximity to each other. One is way down on the Maryland coast called Maryland Eastern Shore. The history of HBCUs is that they are the last standing best vestige of the former Jim Crow de jure segregation in education today by institutions, by pictures, by frame. And these were the schools that largely started in the early part of the 20th century to avoid integration of the traditional white institutions of higher learning. And since 1960s, they've been involved with the US Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights and civil rights organizations in bringing challenges to their unequal status. In short, when the nation integrated in the 1965s and 1970s, 
they opened the doors of the traditional white institutions, such as the University of Mississippi with James Meredith, such as the University of Georgia, the University of Alabama, and you name it, as well as non-Southern institutions opened their doors more to racial diversity too, some of which was the point of my discussion today. However, the Southern states, and by the way, the South doesn't stop at the Mason-Dixon line in the Potomac River of Washington, D.C., because Washington was a de jure segregated, and it goes all the way up to Maryland. And did you know it goes all the way into Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Chester, Pennsylvania, with a historically black college there, too, called Cheney State University? And do you know it goes all the way up to Ohio with Wilberforce University and Central State University? Goes out to Missouri, too. And so the South didn't end in the uh, deep Southern states. And there have been litigation and decisions in Louisiana and in Tennessee and in Alabama and a Title VI, the equivalent of litigation, in uh, Texas involving historically black institutions. But the most seminal and significant one took place in Mississippi, no less after Meredith integrated in 1962. And in 1993, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called U.S. and Ayers versus Fordyce, the governor of Mississippi. And the Supreme Court said that if the historically black college and universities can show today that a practice of by a state with respect to the HBCUs is traceable back to the de jure era, that university may sue and collect damages for relief in perpetuating the vestiges of segregation. This coalition in Maryland sued, and in this time last year, October the 7th, 2013, the United States Federal District Court found that the state of Maryland had violated the law in treating the four historically black colleges and universities unequally and ordered the party to mediation uh, pending a final completion of the trial on the remedy. And ever since then, we've involved in mediation, including a week ago, last Thursday and Friday. This is a suit that I started when I was chief counsel of the Lawyers Committee in the mid-2000s. I continued when I left the Lawyers Committee and became a professor at UDC. And I've been involved as one of the three lead lawyers in the case with a large pro bono law firm called Kirkland & Ellis, my old organization, called the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And pretty much the entire HBCU community is waiting and watching to see what happens in that case in terms of the remedy. Yes? Uh, Professor, I'd like to invite your commentary on the uh, dichotomy you mentioned of public and private relative to institutional academic freedom, uh, the nationwide trend, for instance, to reduce public support for higher learning. And my question would be, at, at what point uh, does that model start to allow perhaps greater institutional freedom by virtue of, of diminished public support uh, for uh, our work. I'll repeat your question as I understand it, and I'll divide it into two questions and invite you to uh, clarify. I think the first question was, what is the basis, shall we say, of the dichotomy between more freedom, especially in using race-sensitive measures and affirmative action for private institutions, in comparison to the public institutions? And the simple answer is the Constitution and the 14th Amendment only applies to the states and not to private institutions. Although the states are subject to general equal protection principles under a part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act called Title VI, which says that no institution educational and otherwise, that receives federal funds may engage in discrimination. And that's the law that's being used right now to enforce and investigate claims of sexual harassment on college campuses and the failure of college campuses to deal with, quote, date rape. However, it's not been a very strong vehicle for the challengers who bring the cases against affirmative action 
as the 14th Amendment. Now, the second part of your question, which I'm not sure I can really answer, is whether there's any correlation in that in what is known today as the privatization of state institutions by the state reducing its financial appropriations for public education while giving public education institutions more discretion and power to raise tuition and to raise fees and put the burden on the state students in particular for attending state public supported institutions. I don't see any correlation between the law and affirmative action and the uh, state's devolution in uh, spending for public education at its colleges and universities. Yes, Chris. Uh, I don't, I can correct if I'm wrong on this, I'm, just, I'm trying to remember, I think I read this way back in the Wallace decision to decide in 2003, but uh, you mentioned the 25 year, so I can kind of coming up with it. I thought I read an article back then that she just pulled that up because it's been 25 years since back, and she said affirmative action was still needed in society. And she said maybe only another 25 years. You're quite right. That's um, what I would call extreme public speculation without any kind of substantial base but and it's probably more of commentators interpretation of what O'Connor allegedly said than any possible reasons why she picked it up out of the sky but certainly it had been as I said 25 years from Bakke to Gruder, Bollinger, University of Michigan. And so it leads to more lore, perhaps, than reality that it would take another 25 years in order to complete the goal of diversifying higher education with race sensitive admissions policies. Yeah, I know the restrictions are actually quoting, actually saying that among those more possible things. Yes. Yes, Beverly. must have had extensive interaction with a large range of interesting characters mm -hmm. on both sides. I was wondering if you could pick out of this history, in your own personal history in a way, some anecdote that gives us who are, I think, all non-lawyers in this room, a little bit of insight into some of the personalities and, and give and take that you know, prevailed in these kinds of situations. Beverly asked, in this three decade plus trek, do I have any personal stories in the quest for equal access to higher education? I'll give you two. Number one, in the recent two years, going back to 2012, as the Texas Fisher case was working its way to the Supreme Court, an interesting development climaxed. That development in its results, and then I'll give you its background, is that Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, the attorney general of Texas, who's now running for governor of Texas. And the Texas Coordinating Board, the agency that governs higher education, all three Republicans in a beak red Republican state align vertically in unison with the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, with La Raza, with the NAACP and all other supporters such as the ACLU in support of affirmative action. Some call that bipartisanship today. Some call it the result that politics makes strange bedfellows. Now that's the result. And it was 
exemplified by the fact that Rick Perry never uttered a hostile word towards affirmative action and towards the University of Texas. Rick Perry selected one of the top appellate Supreme Court experience law firms in Washington, D.C. to defend the University of Texas' plan. Now you might ask why. When Texas adopted the top 10% plan, there was an unintended consequence. The unintended consequence was that Texas didn't foresee that in 1995, after approving the plan, that it would go on to have such unique diversity consequences. The unique diversity consequences is that in a taste testing sense metaphor, white students in certain pockets of Texas that had never tasted the sweetness of sending their high school graduates to the famed University of Texas, all of a sudden began to accumulate a percentage of admissions over the years through the top 10% plan. Rural students gained access that they never had before to the top 10% plan. Lower income persons, particularly white persons, never gained access to the top, to, 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 to admissions to the University of Texas, but for the top 10% plan, included Texas A&M too. And so, as I told you before, from the mid 1980s up to the mid 2007s, excuse me, from the mid 1990s to the uh, first decade of the uh, 2000s, the number of top 10% admits rose to 80%. So the University of Texas persuaded the legislative powers to uh, vote on a bill to repeal the top 10% plan. And since 2003 in the Michigan cases, they could go back to conventional affirmative action plans under the uh, circumscribed provisions of the Michigan cases with the holistic approach and race being one factor, they said there was no need for the top 10% plan. They could not have imagined the kind of protest is going on in Hong Kong right now of demonstrators coming out of a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-jurisdictional, urban, rural, rich, poor, white, black, Latino, Asian, to support the top 10% plan because they all had a vested interest in it. And the legislature voted to uphold the top 10% plan. So in some sense, when you come up to 2012 and you see that unison between Rick Perry and his administration all the way down to the civil rights organization, you can understand the role that the top 10% plan was uh, playing in this case. Now technically, and perhaps as a strategic mistake, Fisher's attorney, although they were challenging the top 10% all along, saying it was too autocratic, it was too automatic, violated the Michigan cases, and so forth, conceded at all argument that it was not attacking the top 10% plan. So the top 10% plan did not come down in any official decision by the Supreme Court, except mainly for Justice Ruth Bayer Ginsburg, who said quite bluntly, let's rip the sheep off of this bed and let's say that this is about race and that it is about the 10% plan and it is about the segregation in the high schools. And while the Supreme Court said it's not deciding the case on race, Justice Ginsburg said it should be decided on race and should be decided on this is the proper way to use race in order to overcome the history of segregation and inequality and lack of opportunity in Texas. And let's uh, be uh, frank about it. And so that's a strange uh, bedfellow story. The uh, next little story I'll tell you uh, about the uh, fight for um, affirmative action uh, comes out of my involvement in public policy advocacy to defeat the uh, Michigan Proposition 1 that, Boomer 1, that passed to become the ban on affirmative action. In all of the post 
vote analysis where the overwhelming number of white voters voted in favor of the initiative referendum to make a constitutional amendment to ban the use of race in education employment and in government contracts. Surprisingly, a majority of white women voted for the measure. White women have been the largest beneficiaries of diversity in government contracts. White women have benefited from diversity in government employment. So the question is, why would white women vote, at least against the interests of many of them, in government contracts and employment? And the surveys, to the extent that they can be relied on, found that white women weren't voting for themselves. They were voting for their children. And they were voting to give their children a leg up in admissions to the University of Michigan and Michigan State and other Michigan public universities without what they felt was competition from non-whites. And when you dig deeper into that layer, they were voting mainly for their white boys because their white girls do not suffer in the underrepresentation of admission to Michigan universities. So they were giving their white boys who face more competition for admission that leg up and that advantage. I thought that was a, an interesting aspect of the fight for or against affirmative action. Well, Yeah. <laughs> 